Before I begin, I'd like to mention the Terror Podcast, which is two guys doing an episode-by-episode episode look at the show. I discovered it a few months after the show aired and listened to the episodes in case he had some historical tidbits that I'd missed. In a way, I turned up in their mailbag part of episode 6. I didn't email them, I didn't even hear about the existence of the podcast until long after it finished airing. I can't find the clip because the podcast appears to be gone from the internet, but if you find a copy, please let me know. In a way, episode 6, a mercy, it's a week until the sun rises again. We open with most of the remaining officers taking stock of what supplies they have left and laying deserved blame at the feet of Goldner, the man who underbid everyone else to provide the provisions. The often spoiled, lead-soaked, occasionally poisoned, rock-and-bone-heavy provisions. Now, in all my previous Franklin videos, I've been calling him Samuel Goldner. So I checked after watching this. It's clear now why the Stefan Goldner Tin Foods Company was the low bidder. I'd like to run that man through. And it appears I was wrong. We have a decent idea of what tinned food aboard the expedition was like, because several ships that sailed with Goldner provisions returned. Goldner vanished after the expedition sailed and was never seen again. They were stocked with food for about five years, discounting the inedible stuff they've but a year's worth left. So Fitzjames has finally worked out what Crozier's known for years. They're going to have to walk out. Fitzjames gets blanky sight of what happened during his 200-mile march to Fury Beach with John Ross in the 1830s. After their ship, the victory became frozen. How Ross waited for years for a thaw that never came, and they were almost out of food when the march began. How Ross said he'd rather leave the sick and infirm than the heavy boats they were dragging. How Blanky wanted to cave his head in with an axe. And once it's past all hope, the mind goes... unnatural, it thought. Ross was a dick. Though he was a literal Victorian military officer, so I take that as red. We don't have any common sailors' accounts of the real events that I know of, but we know something went down, Blanky spoke up, and that Ross was so impressed with Blanky that afterwards he helped him get his own merchant command. So I take some of this with a grain or two of salt. One thing that Blanky forgot to mention is that Ross did actually abandon the boats. His nephew, James Ross, Crozier's friend, was on the expedition and scouted ahead, discovering that the wreckage of the HMS Fury and its supplies that they were heading towards included some repairable boats. The officers kept their stewards and their wolf blankets and what salmon we could catch. The rest of us just slept in ice ditches and fought over year-old biscuits. Blanky's description of the winter at Fury Beach is accurate. How Ross rode in a boat that they were dragging. How he made the exhausted and near-starved men build him and the officers a house. Somerset House. How the officers got first dibs of anything they caught or foraged. After the winter at Fury Beach, the ice melted enough to allow them to sail out and be rescued by a whaling ship, the Isabella. According to Ross's memoirs, this is how their interactions went. What ship are you from? I'm Captain John Ross of the Victory. Captain Ross has been dead these two years! He didn't write it down, but my guess is that his reply involved smacking the guy with a cane. After his rescue, Ross was questioned at a tribunal over the loss of his ship, and was asked about what material use the Northwest Passage would be. He said that it would be utterly useless. My guess is the stenographer omitted the word bitch from his reply. Fun facts, but that expedition was the one where James Ross discovered King William Island, built the first message cairn at Point Victory, and discovered the North Magnetic Pole. And if memory serves, the Isabella, hilariously, was one of John Ross's previous commands. What a stroke of luck! <laughs> now, you might wonder where the Franklin expedition headed south instead of northeast of Fury Beach. It was much closer, and that is one of the most enduring mysteries of the Franklin expedition. Most likely they headed south for a game, but it could be something as simple as them not being sure if the supplies at Fury Beach that kept Ross's men alive in the 1830s were still there. As it turns out, they were. And besides, it does seem that some men did head for Fury Beach. More on that later. Blanky suggests giving the men something to keep their minds from the darkness and desperation, which could easily turn to much worse things. Like splitting open Sir John Ross's head with a bow tax. That if they are to march out of the Arctic at a distance, more than four times what John Ross and the crew of the Victory survived, they're going to need things to keep their minds on, beyond pain, cold, and starvation. So Fitzjames decides to give them a carnival. Now, most people will probably assume that this is one of the more fanciful parts of the series, that there's no way Victorian explorers brought an entire theatre department's worth of costumes and props, but no. This was tradition. It was introduced by Parry almost 20 years earlier as a way to keep the men busy through the long frozen winters. 
They would perform various plays, and senior officers would usually play the parts of women, and they'd hold celebrations for Christmas, New Year, and Guy Fawkes Day. The main problem with this fair is that it seems that the supplies haven't been touched since Sir John brought them on board. Leave it to you, Sir John. And that there's probably too much material than the ships would have brought. The book version is much sillier. It's themed around the Mask of the Red Death. So either the person suggesting it hadn't actually read it, or had an amazingly dark sense of humour. And I have no idea where they got all the red dye from. A few episodes back, I mentioned that Erebus and Terror got frozen to an iceberg in Antarctica. It was large enough that the crews were able to smooth off the ice between the ships, enough to exhaust both of their theatrical supplies, and set up something like this. They even had a dance floor, and the first dance was between Captain Crozier and the beautiful Miss Ross. James Clark Ross in drag. Hopefully, you're beginning to realise that those two were soulmates. Crozier is still cold turkey, being nursed by Jops and his valet. Jobson has experience with helping someone through addiction. His mum was hooked on laudanum after an accident. My guess is this is dramatic license, like Crozier's alcoholism. Good Sir is still feeding Jack of the Monkey. Given the supply problems talked about at the start of the episode, I'm wondering what permission he got for this. Poor Jack goes to to spasm from the lead poisoning and later on begins howling, destroying everything he can, and finally dies in agony. <laughs> This lets Good Sir confirm the lead poisoning and how extra screwed they are. Now, lead poisoning doesn't kill people, it weakens them, it damages their minds, and makes them more susceptible to other things that do kill them. So I'm unconvinced that this is how he'd die. And this experiment's been running for about two weeks. Even if this is how he'd die, I'm pretty sure it would take much longer and much more food. Now, recent studies are getting steam, pun slightly intended, that the high levels of lead in the cellars may well not be just down to the cans, that the ship's water system that featured pipes coated in lead may well have played their part too. And because these guys can't catch a break, lead poisoning also makes old scars and wounds reopen. Collins, the sailor who went under in the diving suit in the first episode, goes to Dr. Stanley trying to talk about having dark thoughts. The same kind of dark thoughts that Blanky warned Fitzjames about. Stanley, though, is the only thing on board colder than the ice and is less than no help, telling him to go to Carnival. Look forward to the party. Mr. Collins, a little fun is what is needed. Fun. One thing the scene touches on, fairly realistically, is the fact that mental health medicine basically didn't exist back then. Stanley was in no position to help, even if he wanted to. Interestingly, we get a drawing of Stanley's daughter, when the real Stanley didn't have a daughter. He had a stepson, who was 11 when the expedition sailed. Stanley married the boy's mother 10 days before they left. In a shocking twist, Stanley goes on to burn the tents. Why did he do that? Was it brought on by lead? Was he hiding his own dark thoughts? Has he concluded that a quick death is better than a slow one? If so, he was kinda right about that in retrospect. I personally like the idea that he was finally pushed over the edge by Good Sir's information about the lead poisoning, that he saw no way out, and it was, as the title suggests, a mercy. But he did say this. It will sort us all out. I have no doubt. Before Good Sir told him about the lead, and he did have these looks earlier on. So I think he'd been thinking about something like this for a while. Honestly, I think the Jacko experimentation plot should have gone to Stanley. Experimenting on an innocent monkey seems a bit more him. But I'd give him more reason for this, and honestly give him a bit more depth. Lady Silence chants out in the ice for hours, waiting for the tomb back, ready to the ritual and try to take control of it. She cuts out her tongue, truly becoming Lady Silence. In the book, she lost her tongue long before the story began, hence her nickname, Lady Silence. She didn't cut it off either. She closed her eyes, stuck it out, and the tomb back bit it off as part of a ritual. It's one of the changes that really no one's surprised they made. The book compared the ritual to communion. The show takes the idea and makes its own less silly looking allusions to communion. At the carnival, as you can see I'm not going in chronological order, each of the men is dressed up. Fitzjames is a Roman, mainly because Tobias Manzies played Brutus in Rome, alongside Kieran Hines as Caesar. Hickey is gone as what looks like the artful Dodger. Good choice, especially seeing as the story had only recently been published. In the book, he went as a polar bear and got flogged for it. Another reason for this revelry is that they've just got too much food and drink to carry, so blowing it on making the men happy makes sense, given what they're going to have to do. Aw, oh, sweet. Blanky's drinking liquor from his wooden leg. That is brilliant. In the book, it's not actually Dr. Stanley who destroys the carnival and kills much of the crew, but the Toonback. 
though Stanley was one of the victims. I can see why they made the change, a mixture of budget issues and variety. Anyway, Stanley spreads the liquor about and ties the men into the tent, as Crozier explains the planned march south. He then sets himself alight and a great many men don't escape the blaze. To make things even more complicated, Lady Silence staggered into the tent beforehand and collapsed from pain and blood loss. Dr. MacDonald of the Terror is stabbed by Hickey as he tries to cut a hole in the tent to save the men trapped inside. Stand back! I'd like to run that man through. Hard to tell if Hickey realized that he could just start the cut higher up and avoid killing the man on the other side of the tent, or if he just didn't care. I suppose which one you gravitate towards will depend on how much depth you think he has as a character. There'd be no question with Book Hickey though, he's a cartoon. An evil, evil cartoon. Anyway, next episode, the march begins. Originally, they were planning on destroying the ships in the blaze, but the discovery of Erebus in 2014 and Terror in 2016 changed those plans. The show was in pre-production for a very long time, the better part of a decade. 